In 2007, over 200 of the world's foremost experts got together and the, gathered at the Faroes Islands for an international conference entitled uh, Fetal Programming and Developmental Toxicity. And basically they said it was a wake-up call for regulatory bodies to look at those age groups which are most vulnerable to chemical environmental exposures, um, which can actually affect them in those growing periods, the periods where there are critical windows of much harm being done in the womb, fetuses, embryos, um, newborns, and how an exposure here in this early time of life can lead to great harm and susceptibility to disease years or decades later. People claim that 1080 has been studied to death. Well, it's absolutely not true. It hasn't been studied to death. It's been, it's been very well studied in certain areas of its toxicology. But it's been very poorly studied in other areas. And some of these other areas are really important. And one of those is hormone disruption. We know that hormone disruptors can be effective in parts per trillion way even below parts per billion. And one part per trillion would be the same as if you're making a gin and tonic. You'd be one drop of gin, and you'd have to then have 660 milk tankers full of tonic to dilute it to one part per trillion. And parts per trillion are enough to disrupt hormone systems. It would take 10,000 lakes the size of Taupo to dilute the annual drop of 1080 into New Zealand's forests to four parts per trillion. So where are the cancer causing or carcinogenicity studies, there aren't any. We are the uh, reproductive studies, particularly focusing on female eggs, there aren't any. We are the developmental studies, early exposures to brain, um, immune system, there aren't any. We are the long-term chronic exposure studies, looking at mitochondrial DNA um, content and mutation rates, there aren't any. Uh, there's a lot of doubts about the substance. It's dangerous. Interestingly, with the, the studies that have been done on hormone disruption of 1080, um, the one that's been used by the Ministry of Health to set the safety standard in New Zealand was one of these studies which was like going through Wellington Harbour with a net with a mesh size as big as a house because it only looked for gross morphological defects. Looking at the design of that experiment, I would conclude that it's not possible to come to any conclusion about the hormone disrupting capabilities of that toxin using that design because it's just fundamentally flawed. Now in fact, the, the design that was used for that experiment, I wouldn't even pass that research in an undergrad level of environmental studies at Victoria University because it just wouldn't stack up. In December 2008, the Ministry of Health released the following statement. Studies show that 1080 can cause fetal skeletal malformation, cardiomyopathy, damage to the heart muscle, and testicular effects reduction in sperm count in animals. To date, there are no known epidemiological studies that have been carried out in relation to 1080 and potential adverse health effects on humans. I think the question we have to ask is, who do we value? Do we value pregnant females and their unborn children, if it's a human, or their unborn birds, if it's a bird, or whatever? I mean, if we value these things, and if we're concerned about them, then we need to have a close look. For years we've been led to believe that 1080 doesn't kill native wildlife, doesn't get into waterways and doesn't kill insects. Of course now it's been proven that not only does it kill native wildlife, get into waterways and kill insects, it's also uptaken by plants. Now in fact in one study they even found being a systemic poison that it killed the aphids living on the plants. So I was part of a small group that did some research on uh, 1080 uh, regarding Rungawa plants. The study showed that um, plants took in 1080. We conducted a trial on puha, uh, which is collected out in the field all the time by Māori, and the tests uh, tested positive that puha does take up 1080 like any other plant. There's several types of puha, it just grows wild out in the bush uh, anywhere. And, and people go and collect them uh, to eat. And, and of course the other thing that we also got to be aware of is, is there's a whole lot of other uh, plants that Māori also use for vegetables, like the kōuka there. 
the cabbage tree. Look, you have a look at the cabbage tree, the way the foliages are. It can capture 10, 80 pallets, no problems at all. And of course, the part that is eaten is the, is the centre, and you peel all the, all the green foliage off and you left with a white centre like cauliflower and that's the part that you eat. So unless all those things are researched, you are never going to know. Native Māori foods and low chemical contaminants and combinations of them should be studied for watercress and eel and puha and any other native food that's consumed in large amounts. And we should be looking at what is happening to our, our children's brain function and disease susceptibility. Detection of 1080 in the muscle tissue of an eel nine days after it last consumed possum gut tissue containing residual 1080 suggests that the metabolism and excretion of sublethal doses of 1080 in longfin eels may be slower than in mammals and birds. The 2005 um, laboratory study, the average level of 1080 from an eel that had con consumed or eaten contaminated muscle was 17.4 parts per billion and the eels that had consumed gut, it was 30.6 parts per billion. Using Ferunda's um, acceptable drinking level of 0 0.6 parts per billion, that's uh, about 30 and 50 times more than that level. The food level, I think, would be enough to actually have epigenetic programming effects on a growing baby. An absence of evidence is not evidence of absence of a potentially um, serious lifelong threat. There's a major um, commercial eel fishery in New Zealand which is exported all over the world. High quality product that leaves the country but the um, potential for having that contaminated, especially this time of the year, the summer time of the year, when the eels are migrating, like I said before, it's not a matter of if they, f they pick up the contamination overseas, it's when. The New Zealand Food Safety Authority was asked whether they test eels destined for human consumption and export for 1080 residues. This is their reply. Due to the generally rapid breakdown of 1080 in the environment and dilution when 1080 hits water, any residue of 1080 in eels would be at such extremely low levels it would be undetectable. The New Zealand Food Safety Authority has therefore not undertaken such testing.